Open your copy of God's Word to Nehemiah, chapter 9 and 10. I know. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we are, just to like lay some groundwork here, Lord willing, we'll finish Nehemiah over the next three weeks. So I'm going to try to cover 9 and 10 today, and then 11 and 12 next week, and then 13 the week following. And then we will be done with Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm aiming to do that because the Scoggin family is going to be heading out on a long road trip across the nation later this month, and I would like to come back in June and be able to start right into Colossians, which is what I'll be walking us through next. And so while I'm out, you'll get to hear uh, Pastor Ed pick up in the Psalms and Pastor Russ get close to finishing the Sermon on the Mount or something like that. We'll see. Colossians. He's going to do Colossians and Titus. Yeah, anyways. That's the plan. So, Nehemiah 9 and 10 today, and as you can see, if you're already there, we've got a lot of text to cover, so I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to jump right to it. Let's pray. Father, as always, we as your people are so grateful for your word. Uh, We are so thankful that you are God who reveals yourself. Lord, we pray that you would... Through your word, reveal yourself afresh to us this morning. Lord, we know your word is powerful. Your word does not go out and return void. And God, we also know that your Holy Spirit is the one who powerfully applies your word to our hearts. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come now and teach us. Teach us your word. Help us to know who you are, Lord. I do pray that you would apply the particular application to every human heart that's in this room this morning. Lord, I pray that there would be a sense, which this is true because your word speaks to all of us, but that there would be a sense among every person who's in this room this morning that you're talking specifically to them. Lord, would you speak through your word now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We all know intuitively and perhaps experientially that dirty things are not meant to be mixed with clean things. Now, perhaps we learn that lesson more by nurture than by nature because it doesn't seem like it tends to be naturally in our children anyway. But I can guarantee you that this same principle stands in different cultures in different ways. And I could give you a million examples this morning to make this point, but I'll just give you a couple to get us started here. Some of you have a rule that before a person can walk into your home, they need to take their shoes off, right? And there could be many reasons for a rule like that, but one certainly is that it will help keep the floors cleaner. We don't have that kind of a rule in our house, but we do at least in our house have a rule that if the three-year-old tries to walk into the home with muddy boots on, he better take those boots off before he comes into the house. Otherwise, he's going to get a scolding from his mother, right? That's because we want to keep our floors relatively clean. We don't want them getting dirtied up in one fell swoop, as often tends to happen when you have that many kids running around. Or perhaps another example for you. In our home... My wife routinely cleans our nice white sheets that are on our bed. Now this past Friday, which is the day that I typically take off every week, I was outside getting some yard work done, and part of the yard work I was doing included slinging up dust and dirt all over myself. So by the time I come into the house, I just have dirt all over my body. Now, how would things go for me if I decided that it was okay to just walk right up to our nice, clean, white sheets on our bed, crawl into bed, and go to sleep? That wouldn't go too well for me. Julie would not be happy with that, and let me comfort you, I wouldn't want to do that either, because there's just something good about being a clean person, getting into a clean bed. So we all get this concept, don't we? At least in some, at some level we do. We want to keep the unblemished unblemished, right? That's why it's so traumatizing even the first time you get that dent on your brand new car, right? Some of us had that experience before. We want to keep the clean clean. We want to keep the flawless flawless. 
And if that's true on the level of our everyday physical experience, how much more is it true when we consider it from a spiritual perspective? The image we get of mankind from the Bible is that we are filthy before God's perfection. The prophet Isaiah writes this in Isaiah 64, 6, and 7. He says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds, even our righteous deeds, are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and you have made us melt in the hands of our iniquities. So here, church, is the truth. God is perfectly righteous. He is perfectly clean. There's no filth in him whatsoever. And to enter his presence, therefore, we must be clean as well. But we're filthy sinners. We are filthy sinners. We're like children who've been slopping around in the mud on a rainy day. And if we know that our own mothers would turn us away Truth. from the door, God is perfectly righteous. For he is perfectly much clean. More There's no filth in him whatsoever for God to, to enter make his us presence. Clean so therefore, that we, can we enter must into be clean his as well. Presence. Because without but that, we don't have a chance. And so that's what we see the people of God longing for in our text in Nehemiah this morning. And truthfully, church, this is what we all should be longing for. God, how are you going to make me, a filthy sinner, clean? Because otherwise I can't go before you. So as sinners, we need to be reminded of how it is that we are cleansed by God. And that, friends, is what God gives us his word for. His word tells us how it is that dirty sinners can be made clean. So as we work through this text this morning, we're going to see God's cleansing word provoke three responses among his people. The first is conviction. The second is confession. And the third is commitment. Conviction, confession, commitment. First, let's consider the conviction that God's word brings. Look with me at Nehemiah 9 verses 1 to 5. We are going to read these verses aloud. <clears throat> this is the word of the Lord. It says, Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Yeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chinani. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shabaniah, and Pethah, Pethahiah said, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. All right, here's where we're at. We find ourselves in our text here in the 24th day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar year. And as we've been working through the preceding chapters here in Nehemiah, we've been in the seventh month of the year since chapter 7. And we've learned that the seventh month of the year was the high point of the year for Jewish worship. In this one month, the people celebrated three significant festivals or days. They celebrated the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booze. And so now we're in the 24th day of the month, which means that All of the feasts that have occurred in this month are done. The feasts are done. But notice the people are still gathering for worship. Okay, it's not enough that all the official ceremonies are over. These people still want to deal with their God and their God is dealing with them. And this was, by the way, the purpose of the feasts. 
The people of God weren't supposed to regulate their religion to just a few feasts a year and then go about their business the rest of their lives. The feasts were meant to remind the people that God was to be their everything. It was a moment that made them stop in their tracks and remember God isn't just for part of your life. He's to be a part of the whole of your life. He's to be your very life. And so the people of God's entire lives were to be devoted to the worship of their God's holy name. And in this case, the feasts had their effect. And and really, as we've seen, as we've been working through these other texts before today even, the effect upon the people of God has been caused by what? The reading of the word of God. The preaching of the word of God. At the beginning of chapter 8, the people gathered at the start of the seventh month and they heard the Bible read and preached for hours on end. Okay, some of you guys are going to struggle today to get through a one-hour service, a one-hour sermon perhaps. These people are like, give it to me for six hours straight. Okay, so we we can toughen up our American mentality a little bit here, I I am confident. So they receive the word, listen to it, preached, and now they're responding to it. And the response, as we've seen again and again, is they fall under conviction for their sin. And then the Bible continued to be taught, even after this first day. It was taught to the heads of the father's houses and to all of the people throughout the entire Feast of Booze, which was a 10-day festival. And now finally it leads to this moment. The preached word of God over a month almost has left the people in a situation where they're desperate to deal with their God. They want to be restored in relationship to him as a people. And so we see them here under deep conviction, deep conviction. How many of you guys have ever had the experience of having a rock get caught in your shoe, right? We've all had that, I'm sure probably even this week, you get a rock stuck in your shoe, are you going to leave it there? No, it's uncomfortable. It's painful. You've got to deal with the rock that's been placed into your shoe or that's fallen into that. That's where the people of God are. They've heard the preaching of the word. It's brought them under conviction and they have to deal with it. It's a rock in their shoe. And so they gather again with fasting and in sackcloth, with earth on their heads, which was a recognition of their earthly lowliness and their sorrow over sin. And in verse 2, we see the purpose of this gathering. The people come to confess their sins and to renew covenant with their God. So once again, they put God's word, we see, at front and center. They spend half the day reading it and allow God's word to propel them into worship. The people gather, they bless the Lord, they bless God's glorious name. They recognize that they exist to bless and to exalt and to praise the name of the one and only God who is Yahweh. So this people has a conviction to deal with their sin. You see, they want to rightly orient their lives according to the worship of their glorious God. And so I just want to ask you, church, as you have been hearing the preached word, not only today, perhaps in your own reading of the word, in your own life, perhaps you've been coming here for weeks and weeks and weeks and the word has just been doing a work on your heart. Are you doing anything with that conviction Do you find yourself under the conviction of the word this very moment? Do you sense a sort of guilt over your sins? Have you noticed that your transgressions, your iniquities against a holy and righteous God that you've been hearing declared here week after week has mounted up such that you don't even know how you're supposed to deal with it? Well, join with the people of God here. Come in dust and sackcloth, and ashes, and say to your God, what must I do to be saved? What do I do, God, with this conviction that you've laid upon my heart? I've come to realize you're real. I've come to realize you must be reckoned with. I've come to realize that there is no escape from the guilt of my iniquities because I will stand before you on the last day. So what do I do with this conviction? I want to encourage you, if that's you, You're in the right place this morning. 
Because the way that you deal with that conviction is through the living and active word of God. God's word tells us. It tells us how to deal with conviction as people who have sinned against the holy God. Run to God with your conviction. Don't try to deal with it in your own power. Bring your sin to God this very morning. Worship him. Pray to him. Trust him. This is what we see God's people doing here. Which leads us to the second response that we see from God's people. And that is confession. It's confession. The second response that the word of God produces in the people of God. We come under conviction. And then what do we do? We go to the Lord in confession. Beginning in verse 6, we see the Levites lead the people of God in prayer. Now, there's a couple of unique facts about the text here. One is that this prayer is the, the longest the word of recorded God prayer the in the God. Bible. We come under conviction, the and then what do we do? We go to the Lord. And that's inst- instructive Lord for us in this morning. Because if Beginning you're in verse under six, conviction of the sin, Levites lead the, the response of God you ought to have is to. Turn now, to the word of God, like the people who do, the we want to keep here. reading God's word, One, and then turn to prayer and confession. It's vitally important to do that. You know, sometimes, especially in reform circles like ours, we can frown upon something that is called the sinner's prayer. You know, so, some of us know what we're talking about when we re- refer to the sinner's prayer. It was a prayer that was really kind of mustered up as a way of trying to get people into the kingdom of God, so it was said... So, so the, the theory was, as long as you can get somebody to say this formulaic sinner's prayer, that guarantees that the person is going to get into heaven because there's something magic about the prayer that ensures them salvation. Now, we know that that's not true because it's not a formulaic prayer that saves a person, but it's God's spirit moving upon a person through his word. But you better not mix up the fact That just because the sinner's prayer in some formulaic way is not a way that you can gain salvation, that does not mean that you ought not to pray when you come under the conviction of God's word. You should say the sinner's prayer. Because that's the response that's appropriate to the conviction of sin. God, I confess I'm a sinner before you. I confess I have nothing to bring to the table. Are you going to save me? Can you save me? Will you save me? God's people pray. But the second fact that's interesting about this prayer is that this is the longest record of Israel's history that we have in the entire Bible in one place. This is a a long prayer of Israel recalling the history of salvation, if you will. These are all the things that God has done amongst us as a people. So the prayer is basically a recollection of how God has saved his people over and over again. And they're reading this to they're, they're reading the Bible together, as you know, through the first five books of the Bible. And now they're recalling all the things that they've been reading through the first five books of the Bible. This is how our God has worked salvation amongst his people over and over again in history. And there's another instructive lesson for us in that church, and that's that God's word propels his people to pray. And God's people love to pray his word. God's people are praying according to his word here. Okay, they're not just doing these random prayers, not that there's anything wrong with random prayers, but they're letting their prayers primarily be informed by what they're learning from the scriptures. One of the things we've been doing on Thursday nights together, for those who have been with us, is we've been working through a book written by a wonderful author named D.A. Carson. The book's called Praying with Paul. And the book really is just walking through Paul's prayers so that we can learn to pray by seeing how the Bible teaches us to pray. So if we want to know how to pray, read your Bible. Pray according to the Bible. Let your prayers be informed by what the scriptures teach. Now, let's ask perhaps a more important question. What's going on in this text? Beginning in verse 6 and going all the way to the end of chapter 9, we have a prayer of confession. And when I say confession, I mean that in two senses. On the one hand, the people are confessing the greatness and the glory and the loving kindness of their awesome God. They're confessing that about God. God, this is who you are. 
you're great, you're mighty. And then on the other hand, the people are confessing their own rebellion and wickedness and sin. It's important to notice that because we see that true confession isn't just a sort of therapy session where we get a bunch of stuff off of our chest. True biblical confession is done before a holy God with a knowledge and a remembrance of who God is. Our guilt, church, is there not just because we haven't worked through it before with another person. Our guilt is a result of wrong that we've done against a true and living and righteous God. So right confession should always be done with a mind toward the God against whom we have sinned. Okay, so let's get into the text together. And unfortunately, we're not going to have time to read through all of this the way that we normally would because of the length of it. So I'm counting on you to open up your Bibles, look with your eyes, and track along with me yourself. I am going to read first from Nehemiah 9, just verse 6. This is what it says. The people pray to God, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, and all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Okay, so the people begin confessing the nature and the power of God. They first recognize that God is Lord alone. Okay, this draws upon Deuteronomy 6, which they, as we saw last week, would have recited as families together every single day. Israel recognized that their God was the only God. There's no other God but Yahweh. If anybody thinks that there can be more gods somewhere out there in the ether, they don't have an understanding of the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible is one. He is Yahweh and he alone is God. He is the one and only creator of heaven and of the heaven of heavens. He is the one who made the earth, the stars and everything in them. And not only that, we see God's people recognize here that he not only made all of creation, but he's the one who preserves and sustains all of creation. And because of that, all of creation ought to worship him. And at least the imagery is given here that the hosts of heaven do worship him, whether that be the angels or the stars crying out, we don't know. But it does at least, because I think that he is thinking in, the author's thinking in uh, creation terms, I think it reminds me at least of the praise that the disciples gave to Jesus as he entered Jerusalem in Luke 19 during his triumphal entry. Now, if you don't Recall what I'm talking about there in Luke 19, Jesus is entering the city of Jerusalem right before his death, the week of his death. And all of the people, if you remember, begin to praise him. They begin to rejoice in him. This is the arrival of the Christ. And apparently their praise was so intense and so extravagant that it made the Pharisees, who of course were the enemies of Jesus, uncomfortable to the point that they went to Jesus and said, Jesus, you need to rebuke your disciples because they are darn near worshiping you right now. You need to rebuke them and shut them up. They shouldn't be talking about you this way. That's the reaction that the Pharisees had toward Jesus. And you remember what Jesus said to them? Jesus said, I tell you, if these were silent, If all these people were silent here, the very stones would cry out to me. Even if all of the people who God has created in his image to worship him, to delight in him, if all of them stand in abject rebellion against him for all eternity, the rocks will do it instead of us. They'll worship him. They'll cry out to him. And so they do. Creation sings of the glory of God. But Nehemiah 9, 6 also reminds us that God didn't just make this creation. He preserves it. He's the one who sustains it. And that includes us, my dear friends. Let me remind you this morning that you are here right now because God is sustaining your life. Have you ever really thought about that before? I mean, we like to, in our culture, consider ourselves as autonomous human beings. You know? We like to think that we're sustaining our own life. That we're the one who's upholding ourselves by the word of our own power in some 
way, shape, or form. And because that's what's in our culture, we, we can very quickly and easily forget that we are literally breathing right now because God is giving us breath. You have the gift of breath right now because God's putting breath in your lungs. And if he wanted that to stop, he could stop it right now. And you'd be gone. You'd be standing before his judgment seat now. Your heart is beating because God is allowing blood to circulate in your body. He's keeping your body going right now. All life that you have is a gift from him that you're receiving at this moment. He's being good to you. That's the point. God is being gracious to you right now to give you life and ensure that you can be here this morning hearing this word preached so that you can respond in worship to him. What are you going to do with that gift? You know, one way to think of this Rather than considering yourself like an autonomous being who has all power within yourself, the spiritual reality is that we're really more like the baby who's in the womb of its mother. Right? The baby only has life because it has an umbilical cord that's attached to his or her mother who's sustaining the life. That's what it is with your life at this very moment, my friend. You only have life because God is currently giving it to you as a gift. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. The Levites affirm these glorious truths about God, but then they move on to remember God's election of his people. Not only that all people are created by God, receiving life from him or being sustained by him, but also that God has chosen to elect a special people for his purposes on earth. Look at Nehemiah 9, verses 7 and 8. It says, You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, to the Hittite, to the Amorite, to the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. Okay, here we see God's gracious election of Abram remembered. God revealed himself to Abraham. And Abraham responded in faith. And he obeyed God out of trust in God's promises. And God has kept his promises to Abraham. That's what's being remembered here. And then next, the prayer moves on to remember the exodus and the wilderness wanderings. And we see that from verse 9 all the way to verse 21. There the people recall their ancestors' affliction as slaves in Egypt. And they remember that God heard their cries and delivered them. He's the God who redeemed his people out of Egypt. He performed signs and wonders and made a name for himself among all the pagan gods, all the Egyptian gods that everybody thought were the most powerful gods because Egypt was the most powerful nation. They turned it out to be nothing because God could snap his fingers and deliver his people out of the hands of the most powerful nation on the earth. He's a deliverer. He's a savior. He saves his people when they're powerless to save themselves. It's no difficulty for God to rescue a people out of the grips of an enemy. So he shows his power to save his people. And then he came down to his people when they were in the wilderness. After he delivered them out of Egypt, he comes down to them and he speaks to them. This is just amazing. God doesn't just save them and say, okay, go figure your life out for yourself. No, he's a covenantal God, meaning he's a relational God. So he condescends and speaks to his people, reveals himself to them at Mount Sinai, speaks to them, gives them the scriptures. And then we see the people remembering that while we were in the wilderness, God provided for every need that we had for 40 years. Right? I mean, some of us are like, man, where's my next paycheck going to come from? God made manna fall out of the sky for his people to eat. He made water come out of a rock for his people to drink. There is a long remembrance that God wants his people to have, that he is a God who not only saves, not only delivers, not only has created his people, but provides for all of his people's needs, all of them, from the first to the last. You're supposed to remember that about your God. And so you get the point so far. 
God is a mighty and powerful creator God. He's the only God, the one and only God. He's a savior. He's a deliverer. He's mighty. He is a God who provides everything like a good father to a son, everything that the son needs. And now, it's at this point that we get to the main argument that the people are making to God in their prayer. And really, it's also the tension that we see between God and his people within the prayer, historically. So look with me at verses 16 to 21. 16 to 21. But they, okay, so remember all that God has done for this people. Y'all remember that? Y'all with me? Everything God's done? But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. That phraseology, stiffen their neck, by the way, I think is referring to the golden calf that they made in the wilderness. They became like what they wanted to worship. They wanted to worship something in the created order, so they became like that. That's what it means to stiffen your neck. You're going to turn your heart away from God. You're going to find yourself looking more and more like the world and less and less like the Son of God, Jesus. But you, listen to this, you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. And the pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them, for, to, to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Okay, in this text we find the primary confession and the hope of this entire prayer. And the pattern gets repeated several times throughout the prayer. Here's the pattern. First, God is good to his people. Not because you deserve it, but because he elects you and chooses to show you grace that you don't deserve. That's what grace is. You don't deserve it. He chooses to be good for you. You say, well, why, like, why would he do that? I don't know. Well, like, why did he choose Abraham? We don't know. Surely there were other people that could have been considered good in the world by pagan standards. But he chooses to be good to his people. That's how he's going to glorify himself, by being a good God who chooses a people that he showers in his goodness. But then we see the next part of the pattern. His people, even though he's been so good to them, his people rebel against him. And they get themselves into all sorts of trouble as a result of their rebellion. And then the next part of the pattern is the people cry out to God to be merciful and to rescue them. And you know what God does? He doesn't say, uh-uh, your time's up. Too bad for you. This is just even more crazy than the, even than the initial goodness that he shows them. God shows mercy again and again and again and rescues his people again and again and again. I mean, the pattern is repeated in the remembrance of the conquest, which is told in verses 22 to 25. God gives this incredible land to his people. He takes them out of the wilderness. He gives them a land that's already filled with vineyards, that's already developed, that already has fruit growing all over the place. He is gifting this, this incredible thing to them. They come in, they take the land, he wins all the victories for them. And then look at verse 26. Nevertheless, after this, another good gift for his people... They were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. And then again, in the era of the judges, where in verse 27, we see that God hears them and their suffering again, according to his great mercies, he saves them. But then in verse 28, they do evil again. 
God sends his prophets to warn the people by the Spirit, yet they refuse to listen to him. They just continue to act presumptuously. And then again, in verse 31, we see this. Nehemiah 9.31 says, Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Church, do you see the pattern here? God's people are recalling their history and they're confessing that they've been a wicked, insolent, sinful, rebellious, careless, reckless, vile people. In fact, they, they've stiffened their necks against God and have chosen to worship themselves and the things of this world so frequently that it would have made the most sense for God to just abandon them and punish them forever. Because Israel had gone into a covenant agreement with God that he was going to be their God, provide blessing to them, and they were going to obey him and be his people. And they broke that covenant again and again and again. A faithless, wicked people. But to their surprise, and listen to this, God never gave up on them. He continued to show steadfast love and mercy to this sinful people. And that leads them to their appeal in verse 32 and 33, which says this, Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have act, acted wickedly. You see what the people are doing here? They're crying out to their God who has shown his greatness, his might, his awesome and glorious salvific work over and over to Israel. And so now they're coming to him and they are asking him to act according to that steadfast love again. Will you show us that love again, God? Will you show us that mercy again? That they pray that God would look upon them and show them that wonderful, marvelous, unending grace afresh. This is a people who were brought to true conviction over their sin. I mean, you see that in verse 33 there. Okay? These people know that God is righteous in all of the punishment that he has brought upon them. They've acted wickedly. They've done wrong to him. Okay, th this is not a man-centered perspective that thinks, well, man is actually really good, so why would God punish anybody? No, 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 this is a recognition of just how wicked a people have been toward their God. They know they've sinned against him. They're in true conviction and they're experiencing true confession. There are people who have presumed upon the grace of God again, thinking, well, maybe he'll just continue to show grace. That's their hope anyway. And perhaps we could even say, shockingly, it's more than a hope. These people, recognizing that they continue to sin and sin and sin and sin and sin, come to God trusting that because of who he is as a God of steadfast love and mercy, he's going to show mercy to his people once again. He's done it before. He'll do it again. Now, perhaps you're in a similar situation this morning. Okay, perhaps God has been good to you time and time again. But you continue to fall. You continue to sin. You continue to fail. And my only question for you is whether or not you're going to confess your sin and turn to the only one who can save you according to his steadfast love and mercy. But you need to know with absolute clarity that you're unable to save yourself. You really are akin to the people of Israel here. They failed again and again and again. And you do too, over and over again. But you see, Israel's only hope was that God would continue to be merciful even in the midst of their failures. And here's the shocking thing. It's not even like, well, this time I'm really going to clean up my life. I'm going to be good. It's going to happen. 
Wait till we get to Nehemiah 13. People of Israel just fail again. And so the question remained for Israel. How would God finally and completely deal with their repeated failure? How's he going to finally deal with this problem of a people who cannot measure up to the perfect standard of righteousness that's required to be in the presence of God as one who has been cleansed because they can't clean themselves? They've tried. And the answer to that, my friends, is only by the perfect work of Jesus. Okay, we have to see that this text, this text leaves us in a place where we're just crying out for a greater salvation. What this text shows us is a people who are in abject, consistent failure. And as much as they may try, they never gain much ground, if any. Often they're going backwards more than they're going forward. So how are they ever going to get to a point of being perfectly cleansed before a holy and righteous God? It it ought to leave us in a place that says, how is he going to do it? And God, we know, provided that salvation by sending Jesus into the world to be the one who would fulfill all perfect righteousness in every way that Israel failed. He's the creator of the world, Jesus is, who joined to creation in a human body. He's the righteous one who never rebelled. He is the true Israel. Matthew even refers to him as being the one who God called as his son up out of Egypt, recalling us to the moment when God brought Israel out of Egypt, so he brought Jesus out of Egypt. We're supposed to be thinking of Jesus as this true Israel. The one who's coming to do all the faithful works that Israel ought to have done themselves. He's the one who is righteous and never rebelled. He's the deliverer of his people who would lead us in a final and complete exodus by delivering his people from the greatest enemy, which is the enemy of our own sin and death. Jesus delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of his, of his, uh, his own kingdom. He's the one who went into the wilderness. If you remember this, he was tempted and tried, but he remained perfect. So you see, church, the people of God in the Old Testament trusted that God would be gracious to them in a more general sense on the basis of his saving work in their history. He's a God of steadfast love and mercy. He's going to provide a way of escape in our time of need. They had a hope in the present and a hope that God would continue to deliver in the future that his grace would continue to abound. But we, unlike Israel at this point in redemptive history, had the pleasure of being able to look back and see that God's grace did abound. Ultimately, his grace abounded in the perfect work of Jesus in our place. So perhaps you're questioning whether or not God will continue to show you mercy in the midst of your sin. Perhaps that's you this morning. I do sin over and over again. Is God going to continue to show me mercy? Is that going to continue to be there? I mean, maybe you're ready to confess, but you wonder on what basis you can even come before a holy God to confess and have assurance that your sin is pardoned. And it's here that I have to remind you that God's salvation was never meant to be contingent upon your performance. It was always dependent upon his mercy towards sinners. And he's shown us that perfect mercy in Christ. So so Paul reminds us in Ephesians that when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ By grace you have been saved. So do you want to know why you can confidently confess your sins again and again, dear believer? Do you want to know why you can constantly come to God, why you can boldly approach the throne of grace over and over as you fail and fall? It's not because your confidence is in yourself, but it's because you've been forgiven by Christ's perfections. Not by your own perfect confession, 
Not by doing everything right and checking off the list and making sure that you've got all your ducks in a row. No, 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 no. Your confidence is that you've been forgiven by the merciful love of God who now makes his people alive together with Christ by his grace. Okay, that's why John can write with confidence in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So don't run away from God with your sin. You've got to run to the only one who can save you from your sin. Run to the merciful God and commit yourself to him as his child afresh every moment of every day. Run to him in confession. Run to him in repentance and receive the mercy that you know that you have because you stand in the grace of Christ. But it does lead us to our final response that we have to the word of God, and that's commitment. Commitment. Chapter 10 clearly shows a covenant renewal between God and his people. So basically, the people of God, through reading the Bible, have recognized their failure to remain faithful to God, though he has been faithful to them. But now they want to commit themselves to him again. So you know what they do? They make a covenant. They put it down in writing. And so in chapter 10, verses 1 to 27, we have a list of men who signed this covenant, saying, God, we're going to be your people. This is what we're going to do. And the list is made up of priests and Levites and laypersons who are the leaders among the people of God. So basically, from top to bottom, God's, God's people are committing to live fully as his people to his glory. Okay, this is the point where I get to just ask you a really direct question. Have you made such a commitment to God? Have you made a commitment not to live for the world, not to live for yourself, but to live for the glory of God alone, no matter what the cost is? Have you made that commitment yourself? We see a name or a list of names here. And I can't help but be reminded of the list of names that's mentioned in Revelation, the list of names that's in the Lamb's Book of Life, the list of names of all those who have been saved by the mercy of God, who have committed themselves to Jesus and Jesus alone, who placed their hope in him for salvation and in nothing else. Have you made that commitment yourself? Is your name down in that book? That's what God's people do. Those who belong to him make this sort of commitment. And here's the thing for those who are the people of God. The word of God calls us to do this again and again every day. We commit ourselves to God afresh every day. We don't presume upon the grace of God like Israel did over and over again. Right? It's Paul's words. Shall I continue to sin so grace may abound? By no means. Though I struggle with sin... I will come under conviction through the word and I will turn again to him and commit my life to him afresh over and over. So commit the day to him every day. Commit the week to him. Commit the year to him. Commit your entire life to him. But I need to assure you here that that commitment is going to be a costly commitment. It isn't comfortable to live for God in a world that hates him. This is a countercultural thing to do. We see here God's people commit to live a countercultural life within their families, within their vocations, and within their worship. So first, we see a commitment to countercultural family. I'm not going to read through it for the sake of time, but just look there at Nehemiah 10, verses 28 to 30. In that text, we see that the people of God are called to live a life that's separated from the people of the land according to the law of God. And the primary commitment that they were to make was to not marry pagan women. Okay, now why is that? Well, if you remember from last week, God's purpose for his people is to see that future generations would be raised up to glorify him, to know him. By the way, if I could just speak to children who are growing up in Christian families, do not presume upon the grace of God. He's the one who placed you in a Christian family where you're learning the word of God, where you're learning the gospel of God. I would even want to call our children, commit yourself to him this day. Make the faith that is your parents your own. Trust in Christ and Christ alone. 
There's nothing better that you could do with your life. But the simple point is that if the family is to be really the center where God's people are passing on the faith from one to the next, it's really hard to do that in a marriage where one person is a pagan and one person worships Yahweh. And it's not that God can't redeem those sorts of situations when they happen, especially in the New Covenant era. God does redeem those sorts of situations today all the time. But the wisdom from God's word is do not marry pagan women. Okay? If you're a single person, you need to marry someone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ because you're to pursue God together and make worship, the worship of God the center of your home. Amen. So believers, marry believers. What do you do if you're married to an unbeliever? Well, there's a lot of good instruction for that too. And you can talk to me after the service if you're curious about that. The Bible has something to say to you. you basically, just keep being faithful. You keep loving the Lord, even in the midst of that. But here's the question, church. Are you committed to set up your family as the central place where the faith is passed along from one generation to the next insofar as it is possible? Even when that's countercultural and everybody says, no, your family's supposed to function like this. You're supposed to be doing this on Sundays. You're supposed to be putting your kids in as many activities so that they don't have any time to even be at the dinner table in the evening to receive the word of God from their daddy and their mommy. What are you going to do when the world is telling you to live your life according to its standards, but God's word is telling you to live it differently? Are you going to commit to God's word and making the home the place where God's word is passed on to your children, ensuring that time and effort and, and uh, everything that's necessary is put there so that they can learn? Or are you going to say, no, 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 we're just going to live like the pagans do? You see, this is a commitment to make God everything in your life. Often the nastiest places in our life are in the home. Right? I'll be nice to my coworkers every once in a while, but then I get home and that's when I really let all my grouchies out. No, no, no. Consistent whole living is what the Christian is called to. Christ is center in every aspect of your life. Yes, including your family. But second, we see a commitment to countercultural vocation. And we see this in verse 31. And the idea of Sabbath observance. Now, we don't have time to go into all the details of that as well this morning. But basically, here's what's going on. Pagan traders were coming into the city, not traitors, but traders, coming into the city. And they would often come into the city on Saturday, which was the Jewish Sabbath. And so they would put pressure on the Jews to work on the Sabbath because that's when the traders were in town. But the people of God, at this point, were called to rest on Saturday. They were called to worship God, to set their minds fully on the things of God on the Sabbath. Are they going to compromise on what God has called them to do in order to satisfy the demands of the world? Or are they going to trust that God's going to care for them and provide for them even when they have to make very difficult decisions to worship their God rather than make an extra buck? That's the question here. The people are going to be tempted not to trust God in their vocation. They're going to be tempted to compromise quite heavily on the truths of who God is and of how they're supposed to live unto him. So church, commit to trust God in your vocation, in your work, in your job. Commit to trust in him even when the world is demanding things of you that you know you cannot comply with. This is going to happen all the time. It's happening to many of you now. You're being asked to do things and say things and promote things that you know a Christian cannot do or say or promote. You must stand up against that. You must not participate in that. I was even talking to Julie just a couple days ago. She was recalling a time when she had a nurse. She was a brand new nurse, and a nurse came up to her and said, hey, you need to go give this drug to this person. It's just a protocol. You know, go, go give it to them. And thank God Julie had the sense to ask, what is this? Of course, she found out that it was a drug that was meant to kill babies. And, and, and she said, I'm not going to go in and administer that. I'm just not going to do it. By the way, anytime I make a note of that, there is grace for people who have made those sorts of decisions even in their life. That's an amazing truth of the gospel, to take pills like that or go through things like that. God is gracious to sinners. Amen. But as sinners, we, 
who, are, who have been called to live according to his kingdom standards, we've got to be willing to take stands on stuff like that, even when it's difficult and really countercultural. You see how the commitment to God isn't just a commitment to come to church every Sunday? You've got to live unto him every moment of every day, even in your workplace. Now, third, there's a commitment to countercultural worship. And we see this starting in Nehemiah 10.32, and then it really goes all the way to verse 39. And here's what we see here. The people commit to keep the worship of God at the center of the community by generously giving to the work of the temple. Okay, so remember at this point in redemptive history, the covenant presence of God dwelled in the temple. So to give, for the people of God to give to the temple work was to preserve the place where God dwelled among his people. It was so important. But under the new covenant, as we've seen over and over again as we've been walking through these two books, God no longer dwells in a temple that's made with human hands. Instead, God dwells in his temple, which is the church. The church is his temple. He indwells his people who gather together, who are built together into a holy structure, a temple for his glory. So God's people are his temple. And so his people then now must commit to preserve his worship in the church. So here's the question here. Are you committed to God's church? Because to be a faithful Christian, to be committed unto Yahweh, means that you will be committed to build the place where his covenant presence resides. So you will be committed to the church. So I'm just going to finish a sermon by reading our church covenant aloud. And then we're going to be done. This is a covenant that, and there's nothing, you know, particularly, uh, the covenant is not the Bible. Um, it's truths that we've derived from the scriptures. But anytime someone joins our church in membership and says, I'm going to join with this particular people to build God's covenant presence in the world, anytime they join, this is what they are committing to. And so I, I just pray that as I read this, God would remind our church, this is what I've committed to. And that he'd give us strength to be faithful to these commitments. Listen to the First Baptist Provo commitments or covenant. Trusting that we are brought by God's grace to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit to surrender our lives to God, we will walk together by faith. We will love and care for each other and we will be faithful to warn, admonish, and rebuke one another. We will be devoted to gathering together for worship, to pray, to teach and proclaim God's word, to baptize believers and to observe the Lord's Supper. We will provide for the ministries of the church through our time, talents, and finances. We will share in one another's joys and bear one another's burdens. We will walk in this world by the power of the Holy Spirit, remaining watchful, denying evil, and pursuing godliness. We will, as a church and as individuals, follow Christ's command to, to take the gospel to the nations. Doing all this for the glory of God our Father, for the love of Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, I know sometimes on weeks when it just feels like we're speeding through the text all too fast... It can, it can be tempting to doubt that your work does its word, or your word does its work, but God, we know that it does. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, by your spirit, really just massage what we've heard into our hearts, Lord. Let us meditate on it, think upon it, and believe it, Lord. God, I pray for anybody who is in this room who really does just need to make a commitment to you for the first time in their life. Lord, I pray that they would do that even today, that they would not leave here. Lord, that you would put a rock in their shoe, uh, that they've got to deal with you before they can even step out of these doors. Uh, Lord, we pray for dozens and hundreds of more baptisms like the one we got to see today, uh, that, that you would pour out your spirit and people would just be committing to you and to build your kingdom left and right. Father, I pray for your saints who have heard this good word today. Lord, I pray that it would be a good reminder of your mercy that is unending toward your people. What a, what a good gospel. What, a good, what good news, Lord, uh, that you save us apart from anything that we do. Lord, I pray that we would cling to that truth even as we remember the Lord's Supper now. We pray in Jesus' name.